Ladies and gentlemen, now we'll take a short, short tour through the boardwalk of the swamp. Five poisonous snakes that live in Okefenokee. And by, no, by, by any obvious means, the rattlesnake is the most dangerous. Not because he's the biggest, but because of the quantity of venom that they can inject. Uh, they are very common in the swamp on the hill. You rarely see them near or in the water. They're up on the hill. They eat things like rabbits, squirrels, birds, uh, small mammals, all of, and there, there are 18 rodents that live in our swamp. And so there's, and they are the most reproductively populous <laughs> animal on earth, rodents. There are more rodents than any other animal on earth. A single pair of rodents can generate as much as 15,000 offspring in one year. 15,000. So there's adequate food for big, for big predators like snakes, wolves, coyotes, foxes, hawks, and owls. Um, uh, these animals are, are equipped with a rattle, hence the obvious name. That rattle is not designed to be a warning. It is a, an artifact of shedding. However, when it sheds, it does not shed the entire scale. Part of it remains attached to the body. So consequently, every time they shed, every time they shed, they, they add another button to their rattle system. And of course, that happens at the proximal end. At the end, it's attached to the body, to the, to the meaty tail. <clears throat> so counting the, the, the number of, uh, of buttons in a rattle does not tell you his age. It only tells you how many times he shed his scales. <clears throat> and fortunately, they do make a noise. They make a very loud noise, and it's, it's very obvious to anyone who's been in the swamp or even out into the woods anywhere. We, we recognize that noise immediately, stop, and take appropriate action <laughs> getting out of there. Talk about the... Uh this particular snake down in the skin that you see there. <clears throat> this animal here in the corner is a eastern diamondback rattlesnake. Eastern diamondback. He is extremely dangerous. Uh, he is the largest poisonous snake in North America. Um, and his, his maximum length is around eight feet long. So that's, you know, like so. It's extremely large. <clears throat> uh, they, uh, they serve a, a very important function on the, in the swamp. And, and of course, they're, they're going to be found on the islands of the swamp, on billies, chessers, uh, uh, on, on this island. And this is the largest island in the swamp, the one, one we're on here. This is the cowhouse island. Uh, Talk about the skin you see there that's been shed and then the other rattlesnake. Okay. There, this exhibit contains two different kind of rattlers. The other one is the timber rattler or cane brake rattler. Uh, he's also very dangerous. They do achieve large size, consequently a large dose of venom. What they do, and they don't go hunting, they, 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 what they do is they, they search for a, a trail. They find a trail where an animal has passed by recently and they'll follow that trail to its, to its maximum stimulation, maximum odor. And that's where he'll sit because that probably is the nesting, near the nesting area of that, that animal, whatever it may be. 
be it a bird or a, a mammal. Um, <clears throat> then they'll sit and wait until an animal, then they have the patience of Job, they'll sit and wait until an animal comes within striking distance, then instantly, and you just, you can't even see it when it's so fast, the strike of a rattlesnake. It's extremely fast. Uh, the, the third kind of rattlesnake we have is a little pygmy rattler. They, they do not achieve big massive size like this. They're only about maybe a foot or two feet long, uh, but they are poisonous. And, but they being small, they don't deliver the quantity uh, of venom that, uh, that these guys do. Uh, consequently, they're not nearly as dangerous. People rarely, rarely ever die from a pygmy rattlesnake bite. Uh, of course, that's assuming that they go to the proper care and, and, uh, and, and treatment. And <clears throat> has this canebrake just shed the skin? Yes, this canebrake over here has just shed here within the last day or two. Uh, has just shed. You see a part of his his scales right here, and they do that three, four, five, six times a year, depending upon their diet and their frequency of eating. If they don't eat much, they don't grow much. Don, are those the rattles on the on the diamondback against the wall? There? Yes, sir. That's his rattles. He looks like he's got about. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, twelve. Uh, about twelve buttons in that rattle system. Mind you again, I say, that's not how old he is. That is in, in simply a record of how many times he shed his scales. And that's a true record too. Because as these guys get older, the rattles get older. And as they crawl through various uh, obstacles, stones and rocks and sand and pet and logs and limbs. Sometimes that brittle rattle will get broken off, and that again give, is not the true age of the snake. It's simply a record of how many times he shed his scales. Bears are uh, have always been a part of the swamp. They, we estimate that there's as many as 800 bears in our swamp today. Uh, bears are omnivorous, will eat absolutely anything, from the bark off of a tree to carrion, any dead animal they find, they, be, they don't hesitate to eat things that are rotten or, or decaying. Uh, they also eat vegetation, they eat nuts, berries, seeds, flowers, uh, small animals that they can reasonably catch, and they are excellent climbers they, and fast. They can shoot up a pine tree so quick, you just can't begin to believe how fast they can climb. And when they're going up that pine tree, they probably will run into this fellow up here. This is a barn owl. We have three kinds of owls in the swamp, four kinds, excuse me, four kinds, but this is the barn owl, uh, because, simply because of his habit of nesting in any available man-made structures. Um, but they are masters at stealth. Stealth, the, the ability to fly without making noise. On the leading edge of his wings, on the leading edge, this part right here, it's they have very, very fine, soft feathers so that it doesn't create any turbulence that would make a noise. So they fly silently, and they're very good at it. They, they, their hearing is as good as their flight is silent. Very good, very good hearing. And their, and their hearing, the, the ear canal on the left side is different from the ear canal on the right side. 
And you will often see owls doing this. And what he's doing is creating a triangle from the source of that noise, which may be out there 15 feet away, to this ear and then to this ear. Because as he moves, he, cr he creates that triangle of distance here, and he, his, his brain then can calculate exactly how far away that noise is at the other end of the triangle, at the apex. So they are excellent at that. Consequently, when they sail off, they can't see what they're going for, but they know it's out there, and they know exactly where it is. 17 feet, three and a half feet, <laughs> three and a half inches. <laughs> Up here we see, uh, above us, we see a, a, another predator, the red-shouldered hawk. Red-shouldered hawk. There are a number of species of hawks in the swamp. The marsh hawk is another species. Uh, both are excellent predators. Uh, they do not have the, uh, the uh, super hearing that the owls do, but they have the super flight. They're extremely fast. Uh, they have very powerful talons, creating as much as two or three hundred pounds. And so when they light into an object, an owl, a, 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 a prey, and closes down on it, he actually punctures the skull of the animal. They, uh, the, uh, there's another owl, another hawk in here called Cooper's hawk. Cooper's hawk is a small hawk who eats birds, <laughs> and he's very good at it. He has the capacity of chasing birds into a bush, and he'll, he's known to fly through bushes to, to, uh, to catch birds, songbirds, that are hiding, they think. But he's, the Cooper's hawk is, is one that can fly right into a bush. We have a number of animals that live in water, and the otter is one of the terrestrial hunters who, who also lives in water. They um, are excellent swimmers. Their, their hind feet are very open up to make very large paddles. Um, Al, I mean, uh, otters also <coughs> have a peculiar vision adjustment. When they go underwater, otters have the capacity of changing the shape of their eye. They, they actually have a muscle inside their eye that will change the shape to adjust for the refractive index of water because he hunts underwater and consequently he, he needs to be exact on his, in his vision. So that's, that's one of the unique features of otters is that they actually change the shape of their eyeball and change the focal point of the light rays coming from the, from the water through his eyes and out to, back to his retina. And they're very successful. They reproduce in the springtime, having little, little kittens, maybe one or two offspring. And they, they, they t are often seen in a family group, a male and a female and a pup. Beavers <coughs> are an, uh, a common inhabitant of the edge of the swamp. They, and I say edge, I mean the first mile or so. <clears throat> from the from the land into the water out about a mile or so you might see a beaver um, beavers <clears throat> have this capacity of cutting down small or large trees and they build a nest they usually build a nest in the water their nest in the water is and it has several rooms in it it has a pantry because he'll, he'll go out <clears throat> and collect some small twigs, he cut down some young trees, you know, like saplings, small things. And he'll bring the, those tender, juicy uh, saplings down to the water and into their pantry. 
which is underwater. So it keeps those, those living things alive all the time until they go back. When they, <clears throat> in the wintertime, when they can't go out and eat somewhere, they, uh, they just go into their pantry and pick up a couple of rich um, twigs. Now, <clears throat> they do not eat wood. They eat the bark, they eat the leaves, and they eat the little tiny twigs because that's where the nutrients are. That's where the, the manufacturing of sugar is. The, uh, so so they, they have adequate food all through the winter. <clears throat> Their big fat tail serves a lot of purposes. Obviously, locomotion. Number two, fat storage. It is a literally a packaged fat. <clears throat> and three, it's an alarm system. It's an alarm system. <clears throat> if you happen to walk through the swamp in the evenings or, or just at sunset, sundown, you may hear a loud slap on the water. That's an, a beaver that has seen you and is warning everybody else, hey, it's time to duck. We got a visitor. Great blues. This is, a, this is a, a, a great blue heron, one of the major <coughs> predator birds. Uh, he will eat almost anything that he can find in water. That's their favorite habitat. However, as they approach the beach, they would also take frogs, toads, lizards, small snakes, almost anything that is edible and, and is moving. Uh, they're, <clears throat> like all wading birds, like all wading birds, <clears throat> their, their leg, their leg bend at the elbow <laughs> for me. But on them, it's their knee. It's what we would call their knee, but it's really something else. All right. But the, when they bend their leg to, to pick it up and take a step forward, they, they bend and create ripples going behind them. The ripples go backwards because they, they open their, they, they pick up their leg this way, and so the, the moving part makes ripples that go back, not forward. <coughs> uh, so that's a, a, an adaptation to, uh, uh, to, to, to success. Uh, also, they have a built-in refraction index correction built into their eye. Because when you and I see a fish in the water, if you shot at him, you'd miss him. Because of the refractive index of water, it bends the light ray. When, it, when light changes the medium in which it's moving, either air or water, it changes direction. When, when light leaves the water and, come and goes through the air to his eye, it, it speeds up because air is less dense than water. So it changes speed and, and he has a built-in refractive correction for that. Consequently, when he strikes at a, an image in the water, he strikes it where he is, not where he appears to be to us. So that's another success story for evolution. On a living owl, <coughs> those bars are very evident. They're wide and they're dark, so it's, that's why it's called a barred owl. He's the most common owl in our swamp. He, he's often heard, it happens right here in the park. There's, they, they communicate with each other by talking. And uh, just a few weeks ago, my wife and I were here <clears throat> to a meeting. And uh, as we were leaving, we passed a, a pair of these that started talking. And it's a, 
It's a loud display. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a loud vocal display. And then sometimes they, out, they, they have another pattern of speech. And it's called, they're, who cooks? Who, who, who? Um, how to do that? Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you? Who, 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 who? Anyhow, it comes out, who cooks for you? That's their, uh, the usual call. But then they, when they get excited, they, they go through that loud and, and ruckus noise they make. Uh, it even scared my wife the other night. Uh, there are many duck <laughs> uh, populations in the swamp. The wood duck is probably the most uh, beautiful of our ducks. It has great coloration in its, in its, in its feather patterns. Um, and they, their, their call is unique. They seem to whistle. They make a loud whistling noise uh, when they communicate with each other. Um, wood ducks will, t uh, will, uh, will uh, widen any, they'll, they, somehow they do it, they widen any cavity they can find. It's big enough so they can get in and out. Um, there she'll lay her eggs, uh, and um, when they hatch, when they hatch, she's right there with them. She knows what's go what's going on, and then she'll jump down on the water and she'll call them. She'll call them and say, "Now's the time to swim." So they have to jump out of the out of the, the, the nest hole, all the way down, and it may be 20, 30, or 40 feet down to the water. But those little tiny babies, or they might be uh, on the shore, but they they fall down through the debris and the limbs, and they uh, somehow they make it. Uh, uh, wood ducks eat minnows, fish, tadpoles, uh, almost any small thing that, that they can catch in the water. The gray fox, of course, is one of two. We have a red and a gray fox. And uh, sometimes we have coyotes. The, the gray fox is the one that's most often hunted by dogs uh, because the fox hunters can tell when, the fo when that fox has treed. They can tell if he's, if he's still running because of the, the way the s sounds of the, the bark of the dogs, but when it stops changing and it becomes one constant bark at, at the same intensity, at the same distance and the same, uh, same uh, intensity, uh, then they know that the fox is treed. The gray fox has claws like a kitty cat. They can actually ting, retract their claws or they can expend their claws and climb right up a tree. The red fox has been known to, to try that, and maybe it could climb s somewhat, but nothing like this guy can. The, red fo the gray fox is an excellent climber. They, uh, they have enemies too. That, uh, that rattlesnake over there would be a big problem for him. Uh, coyotes. They have to watch out for coyotes because they will certainly consume a, a small fox like that. But fortunately, they can't climb, not like the gray fox can. White-tailed deer, probably the most common game animal in Georgia. Uh, just thousands of them are killed every year, but they still seem to repopulate every spring. Uh, this, of course, is a male, and you can tell it's a male by the, by the presence of antlers. That's not to say that females don't ever have antlers. It might happen, but very, very rarely. Uh, and antlers are made of bone. 
they grow from the skull. They grow from the skull bone, and every year they they reach a maximum uh, size and de and degree of development, and then they form in the springtime. They form a uh, abscission layer right at the base of the of the antler, or the the main frame. This is the main frame. The main frame forms an abscission layer, and when she bumps into something, or he does, bumps into something, they might just knock them off, or they might fall off. But they do regrow them every year. Uh, and the pattern is not always uniform. As you can see here, that side has three points, this one has two points. Uh, antlers, of course, are for that the males compete for female attention uh, every year. Um, hmm. Deer are obviously true vegetarians, uh, and there's a adequate food in the swamp to support a deer population. Uh, about the only animal that could really hurt a deer would be a, a coyote or a wolf. We used to have a red wolf that lived here, and wolves were a part of the system. Uh, the, the, if this animal gets close to the water, he's, he's in danger. The alligators are so fast, so unbelievably fast, that they can explode from the water, grab an animal, and pull him in, and drown him in a matter of minutes. Uh, so it's, it doesn't seem like they can pass along that, 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 that danger of being close to the edge because it still happens every year, every year. That's a fox squirrel. The, the red squirrel and the, and the, fox, and the gray squirrel are, are small and they live in leafy, leafy vegetation. Where, where there's an oak leaves and sycamore and uh, persimmons and things like that. Whereas this guy, the fox squirrel, is a pine forest squirrel. And he spends most of his time on the ground. He's not a, a tree eater. He, he's, he eats most of his stuff on the ground. Now, he also has the capacity to smell truffles, underground mushrooms, truffles. Uh, and at the base of most pine trees, 80% of all vegetation has truffles around them. 80% of all vegetation, all trees, have truffles under the bottom of them. And so that fox squirrel can smell them. Six or eight inches under the ground, he can smell them, and he can, he'll, he'll then obviously dig them out and have lunch. And when he, <clears throat> when he eats them, he swallows the spores. The spores of that, of that truffle are not digested. They are not destroyed through the digestive process. So as, <clears throat> as that squirrel is hopping along the ground and excreting little pellets of feces every day or two, he's spreading the joy <laughs> of new generations of truffles year after year after year. <clears throat> uh, and so that's a, a wonderful ecosystem right there. Now, when that hawk or that owl over there sees this fellow on the ground, uh-oh, <laughs> then, we, then we've got a problem. Then the, then the owl or the hawk or the coyote will certainly attract, be, try to make lunch out of him. But he's an extremely good climber too. He, he's, not a, he, he's not easily caught. This is one of, <clears throat> one of our most recent residents of the southeast, the armadillo. Armadillo came from us, came to us from Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> and it, very gradually they, they migrated east from, from uh, Texas 
and uh, Arizona. They migrated east and west and north. And now armadillos are found up in North Carolina and, and Midwest. Uh, they're, they're very widespread. The unique thing about armadillos is that when they reproduce, they are male and female. They have cop they copulate male and female, and he and she will only produce one egg. He may produce ten million sperm, but only one of them will fertilize their, her egg. Uh, and her egg then will go through this process of cell division twice. So if you take one cell and divide it once, you get two. If you divide it twice, you get four. Those four then stop dividing and become individual uh, armadillos. So when she reproduces, when those little critters are born, there's always four. There are identical quadruplets every time. Identical quadruplets. They're about two or three inches long, and they're just a tasty morsel <laughs> in this ecosystem of a Okefenokee.